Marco Halloran, you're very welcome to the Creative Souls of Clare podcast. I'm very conscious you're, I don't know, you're, you are a Clare man, but where does that begin and end? I'm curious about all that. So can we go right back to the beginning, Mark? And you're an Ennis man at heart or originally. And can you tell me about young Mark and life back in the day? And, you know, where did it all begin? Well, I was born in 1970 uh, to a, a large family. I was the eighth child and there was two more yet to come after me. We lived in a very small house in the town. Um, do you know, I thought Ennis was the entire universe when I was growing up. And maybe it is. I'm not sure. Ah, but um, <clears throat> Here we go. Um, <laughs> but it was the only thing. Obviously, it's the only thing, you know, I never we weren't the type of family that went on holidays abroad. We had a caravan down in Spanish Point and we used to go there or to Kilkee. We'd visit sometimes to visit aunts and uncles or, you know, maybe up to La Hinge. Yeah. Um, but we never, you know, I my 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 mom and dad's relatives lived in Limerick. So we'd go to Limerick maybe once a year. I, I didn't go to Galway until I was 18. I didn't go to Dublin until I was 20. Like I never oh, left the country yeah, until yeah. I was 21. That was the kind of way that things were back then. So I was kind of aware that, I, I, I felt that that uh, Ennis was the entire world. But then again, you don't, you know, I think I had strong desires towards being an actor from very early on or to be a, a creator or a writer or something. But it felt in some ways as if you weren't allowed to be that. I don't know. Okay. That yeah. Sense. The idea that you would say to your parents, I want to write something. I think that this sounds very odd, but I think we felt as if we were ordinary people, you know. Not that I think that artists are extraordinary people, but that was the received wisdom that we'd been given. Artists were extraordinary people. You were born an artist. So you couldn't be from Ordnagrania and be an artist. That was kind of outside yeah. of the... And I spent a lot, a lot of time kind of battling against that idea. And, uh, and it took a kind of realization that actually artwork is ordinary, is really ordinary actually. It's about observation of life. And it's about living actually. Um, if you're connected to life, then you can write about it or you can find some truth uh, about your experiences within it. Um, and that kind of set me free to, to become a writer. But that wasn't until my 30s, you know. Mm. I, was very, I was a very slow burner. <laughs> well, there's a lot in that. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the the area you said you're from, Ardna Grena, is that correct? Yeah, um, down like the, the that... railway station. Would that be what you describe as, or could it be described as, a, a, like a, what we what we sometimes call a working class upbringing? I'm confused about the class thing. Yeah, the terminology gets a bit messy down the road. So it? it wasn't social housing, but the yeah. social housing was very close by. But we lived in a very small. There was no front garden or back garden. It was a very small three bedroomed house. Uh, now, when I say three bedroom, that was if you use one, if you use the sitting room as a bedroom. So there was the boys room, the girls room and my mom and dad in this really, really small house. Yeah. Both my parents worked. My mother worked in a betting office and my father worked in posts and telegraphs. Um, I think he started off, you know, as as almost, you know, climbing poles, but he he, he worked his way up to sort of, uh, I suppose, middle management or whatever you'd call it by the time he retired. So like. I would have seen us when we grew up, we had absolutely no money. Uh, there was no spare money whatsoever. But I don't know whether we call ourselves working class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know. And and, and maybe that's most people. And, and that becomes like a, almost an academic or a, a sociological kind of frame that people don't use upon themselves. Um, but I am curious about, you know, the work that you've created over the years. There, For mm. me, anyway, there seems to be a sensibility of an awareness of what you might call then the ordinary person's life, which in many ways is struggle and and getting by and and you know not living a a, a fancy existence and and trying to get out and better yourself or advance yourself or social mobility or maybe also it's okay to have what we sometimes call a smaller existence where we're not flying all around the world and dropping yeah. car carbon emissions everywhere. I think there was one thing that I was aware of that within the town and this was a thing that was very true of towns like there was 
a sort of unspoken class system within Irish towns, which was the solicitor, the, the estate agent, yeah. the doctors, uh, the professional class were always there, shop owners, perhaps large shop owners were on the inside and others were on the outside. Yeah. And my family would have been very much on the outside. We didn't matter to any of these circles or to yeah, these yeah. cliques or, or whatever. And I think that I could see that as being a frustration in my father's life. He always felt that there was somebody, there was somebody laughing at us in some way, or that there was somebody on the inside that wasn't. And there was no, there was no, uh, I mean, you, coming from where I was, you became a, if you wanted to, you became a party operative within the political system. You know, you, you put up posters for some, uh, as some of my neighbours did for some of the political parties, but you didn't, you weren't chosen to run, you weren't chosen as a representative, you weren't that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but then there was other things that, that my father used to excel at and which he loved, which was he loved to be involved in the musical society that was in Ennis and put on shows. And, uh, and that was very kind of egalitarian. There would always be like, the guy who worked in the butcher shop who was singing the lead role in the Mikado or something like that, who was playing Pooba in the Mikado or something like that. And I'd go and see that. And I loved, I loved the, I loved the, the feeling sitting in the little seats in the, in the, the Holy Family Hall and the community would see the guy from the post office come on and sing a romantic song to the girl who's the secretary in the school and they'd, they'd, they'd celebrate them in some way or, or cheer them on and I kind of loved that I kind of was like really into that so in a weird way all of that kind of fed into to feelings of of, of 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 being aware of seeing what it is to be even in subtle ways to be outside of things I don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever. yeah it does it does um do you, do you think there's something in that whereby it is helpful or perhaps implicit that an artist is outside of things in order to be an artist? Well, I think that an artist needs to, needs to be able to put a block up and look. I, I know a lot of artists and writers who delayed their, their writing because they wanted to write about their families and they felt they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And in ways you just had to put up a block and go and do it if that's what you need to do. Um, so there is, there is, a, I do think there needs to be a reserve because you've got to take away what you're seeing and think about it and try and make sense of it and put things together. So in a way, there is a kind of a remove. I mean, I find myself, you know, it would be very difficult for me, for instance, to live with people because I need a lot of time on my own sitting around reading books and thinking to myself, big thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> big giant thoughts big that, huge thoughts that just land like um, yeah and at the same time I'd imagine I mean this comes up a lot actually the, the idea of being needing that space uh but at the same time needing community as well that the two yeah. of them operate side by side I, I think the pandemic was an interesting one for me because I was living alone and suddenly I was locked in the house kind of on my own and uh, I got a lot of work done, but I was absolutely going mental because a lot of my socialization that I have is I know fellas in record shops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I go and I'd look at records and then I go, hey, how are you? Yeah, blah, blah. And you'd have informal chats. And I realized yeah. that a lot of my social interactions were informal chats that I'd meet with people. I was not, I'm, I've never been great for, will we meet for coffee at 10.30 in XYZ? Yeah. I'd literally run into people and, and that kind of life in the town I've always really liked, the idea yeah. of coincidence or meeting by coincidence. And, and a lot of that is in my work actually, people going on wanders and meeting things. And uh, so when the pandemic happened, all of that was closed down and I was like, my entire social existence is dead. <laughs> and uh, I found that tough, for a while um but i adopted a cat and i got on with my work yeah well listen i i suppose the animals are or whatever it i suppose animals do bring a lot of joy and friendship to people's lives there's no getting away from that they um, do and they're missed especially a little cat this little cat that i have is such a little mystery she stares yeah. at you sometimes and uh -huh. then you stare back and you go like what is going on in your head <laughs> and they judge you cats judge you in a kind of a way you know they, well, they come up to you and go rub me rub me rub me and then you rub them and they go get off 
and they wander away. And I kind of, I really enjoy that. I was like, you came over here. Yeah, it's a trip to see an other being. Uh, I have one for you, actually, uh, in terms of being judged. Have you ever been judged by a donkey? <laughs> no, at 4 a.m. Um, so so we live surrounded by fields and there are some cows in many fields and then donkeys in another field and then um, anyway I've gave away the the spoiler here but uh, I got woken up the other day <laughs> the other night 4 a.m. I thought there was somebody outside my window and um, freaked out for a moment then I looked out and there was a big donkey's head just staring <laughs> at me Anyway, I decided to go outside and the donkey just had a stare it just stared at me and it was it was like full moon so it was um you know the, it was quite ethereal spooky light yeah and we were just like what why are what you on here? earth is going on in there in the donkey head? the donkey had said why are you here exactly yeah got big 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 knotty old heads on them donkeys have they're cute though they do we, we enjoy um feeding them apples and watching their jaws flying all over the place <laughs> 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 exactly exactly so mark when you said you you kind of hit that moment of the pandemic and realizing that perhaps you needed to uh address something or make make a move um whether it be a cat or whatever but is was there an awareness there of how things could go for you in terms of like oh god like this could be get get messy if i don't make some conscious adjustments well i think all of us went through that um, yeah I, I I felt right at the start, I had one or two nights where, you know, I just kind of panicked and was like, what is, is everything lost? And I can be sometimes in my darker moments, I can have ca catastrophic thoughts and I was going like, is everything lost? Is it all gone? But then you make patterns, you know, that's how I get through things. I make patterns. I do my walk at two o'clock or I have my sandwich at, at five past twelve or I, you know, I <laughs> make these these conscious patterns for yourself that feel like a type of reality and you get on with things. I also have really nice neighbors here. Uh, I think the community that I have, that I am part of here is very strong and stable. And they did things like they were planting flowers, you know, at social distance, but they'd leave out flowers for people if they want to do the, the, the planting there, that's good. Or they painted the back wall in the little cul-de-sac that I, <clears throat> that I live in. Or even at the time when they were doing that thing for clapping people, you know the clapping of the 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 healthcare workers the neighbor knocked on my door and said well, we coordinated all together and blah blah and we all clapped and then we all laughed our asses off at, at kind of it being very futile uh kind of gesture but i felt them there and i thought that was really important actually i wondered what it would be like to live in an apartment where it was maybe a quarter community mm -hmm. i felt i feel that would have been harder yeah and and also then the um i've, I've often thought about like old you, you know like traditionally there'd always be one older person living up a boreen on their own up a yeah. back road like and all they have is the news and the radio or whatever <clears throat> but i mean with my own mother i didn't see her for a year um wow. and she wasn't able to see her grandkids my mother's of a certain age now you know and uh and that was all very difficult for all of us. She went up and stayed for a while up in Sligo with my sister who lives in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so, and that was a really wonderful thing for my mother to be able to do that. But a lot of the time she spent there alone and her choir was gone, her church was gone. <clears throat> and I think, and I think for a lot of older people, there was aware awareness that they didn't have a huge amount of time left in the world, just naturally. Uh, and that 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 time was being was ticking down with them locked in a house, and I think that was must have been incredibly difficult. I know my mother found it tough, and yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I I think sometimes that gets well is being lost when we are kind of thinking about what about me, what about me. It's yeah. not about you all the time here, you know. That's a shocking revelation to me every time I hear that. It's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this podcast is about it's you. It's about Mark. me. Really glad to hear. <laughs> so, so going back to you, Mark. <laughs> yes. Um, so, what what has been uh, your creative practice like in the last year or so? Have you, you you said you got a lot of work done, and you obviously released a film right in the middle of it? Didn't yes, you? I did. There was a film that I had called Rialto, which played in the, the the venice film festival just before in the season before lockdown 
it came and played in Dublin in the Dublin Film Festival days before lockdown. And then we were just about to go to cinema and everything closed down. And uh, and then during the summer, we were about to release it again and everything closed down again. So I think it got released for three days in the cinema, but it's available online and uh, and it's a piece of work that I'm, it's, it's not a, an easy watch. It's difficult about a man who suffers just like a complete breakdown in his sense of self and uh, and um, it's got brilliant performances by uh, Tom Von Lawler and uh, Tom Glyn Carney. They play the two leads. You have to have a double barrel name to be in a film these days. Um, so I thought they were wonderful in it. So I'm very proud of it. But yeah, anybody who had a film to be released during that time was 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 stuck. But I, I was about to lock myself away in my house to do some work because I had a couple of commissions that I needed to get done when lockdown actually happened. Um, and I, I I landed another piece of art. I basically said anybody who wanted to offer me work for writing work for a year, I'd do, you know, and uh, I ended up writing 10 scripts, which is kind of a crazy amount of work. Now, some of them were half hour TV scripts. Um, Two of them were plays. One was a libretto for an opera. Uh, so it was all kind of, uh, I literally got up every day and I sat at my desk every day and I wrote every day and then I went for a walk and then I came home um, and there was nothing else to do basically. Look and wait for numbers to come through on the news and go, oh my God. Um, well, you had to keep your Twitter going, Mark. I like Twitter is my <laughs> other occupation. Yeah, let, let's talk about that for a moment. <laughs> My Twitter, I really like Twitter for all of the hellishness that, that goes with it and the fighting and the shouting and the... Yeah. Um, I have a thing with Twitter, though. You know, I, I have some... I, I see some people who get really angry on Twitter and then they, they say, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity and blah, blah. And I go, are you being yourself on Twitter? Mm. If you're being yourself on Twitter, you're absolutely crazy to be on there. Like, play yourself on there. So, like, when I go on, I play this ridiculous version of myself. I up my ego. I I, I pretend to, to run for the presidency at one point. I do this. I have a game, like, but I'm not me on Twitter. Yeah. I, I pretend to be me. And so when people come at you or when trolls come and say you're a big old faggot on, online, it doesn't hurt. You go, yeah, so what? It doesn't, you know, so, so I think that people have got to learn to put distance between themselves. Now, it's not the same as putting up a fake account and going after people. It's put up your name, be yourself very visibly, but play yourself, you know, mm. give yourself stupid attributes. Pretend, you know, I pretended to be a professional basketball player for a while on Twitter. You know, there's nothing, there's no reason why you shouldn't do that. Well, yeah. you, you, in some ways, you've uh, created a theatrical existence through a new medium there, you know? It's, yeah, exactly. You've made exactly. Twitter work for you. Exactly. Now, I wish I could monetize that situation, but that's the next level. Well, I mean, I, I think, like, you deserve some sort of award for that, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so aside from the Twittering, um, you know, you talk about like having your sandwich at a certain time and your your set routines and your rituals um d does that suggest that perhaps you're getting up and on the chair at the computer at set times how do you kind of manage your day i think each project suggests its own work method so there are some projects where i some for some reason i'll sleep until 11 every morning and get up and i'll wander around and i won't sit down till three and there are other projects where i'll be up at eight o'clock in the morning and i'll work really early like it's each project tends to set its own yeah its own boundaries and it, those change and maybe i need that change there are some that i i work on my laptop in my in my little sitting room and there are some that i work here on my workstation here um if i'm doing two projects at the same time i'll try and differentiate them with the machine so i'll use the laptop and blah blah, blah just so you can just change space um but i mean it sounds like I'm incredibly disciplined and I actually feel like the laziest person on earth sometimes. I'm not disciplined in that I do this and I do my 4.5 hours every day. Mm -hmm. 
I just do what I do and try and get a certain amount done and, and then get up from the desk and walk around. And then some days I'll just get up and I'll be sitting at my desk and I'll go, I think I'll give myself a day off. Yay. Proper order, <laughs> yeah. Off. Well, look, at I mean, in many ways, that's part of the, the whole point or benefit of being self-employed is that there are many, like there's public holidays and that you don't necessarily get or be paid for and you take your own public holidays. For um, sure. For sure. Yeah, you got to enjoy the, the fruits of it. Um, but I, I am thinking that, Mark, um, that that kind of fluidity that you have in terms of not having set space, day, time, underpinning that could be like the experience that you have behind you that at some level you know that you're going to deliver, you know, where somebody else may not have that experience and it may go all over the show. But you there's a professional run in the show as well here, you know? Well, I mean, it's something that I've learned. Like I, I sometimes teach people who are, I, I like, I prefer teaching people who are, who want to write, but have never written before. And I try to get people started when I do these kind of mm. workshop things. And sometimes I'll meet people and they'll go, I've written the first act of a, you know, a three act film. I've written the first 30 pages and I can't go on. And I was like, why can't you go on? And they're, they say, because I'm afraid I'll break it. And I'd be like, there's nothing to break. You haven't completed anything. So there's nothing to break. There's nothing to break. So you have to complete something in order for it. So I'm, I'm very much, if I start something, I'll finish it. It's sometimes some things might take a long time. Sometimes things will take, can flow really quickly, but you have to finish it. What's what's uh, what's the longest thing you've ever done, or what has taken the longest? <clears throat> well, there's something that I'm writing for Lenny at the moment, and that we hope to make next year. And uh, I started it in 2008. <laughs> that's, uh, all right. that's all right. Now I didn't spend obviously all the time. I kept yeah, I writing it, and it was difficult, and I left it down. And I kept, and Lenny actually kept going. Look, why don't you go back and try again? And I tried maybe three times, and then I came back to it during lockdown, and it kind of flowed a little better. But I actually don't think I could have written it until this moment because I there's certain technical things that I didn't know my way around enough, and uh, and also I think that Lenny's in the space to kind of he knows more about what exactly he wants so he's able to articulate that more clearly and yeah. I'm to go well yeah I can get there with that uh, so some things take a long time I have a play that's going to go on in uh, later on this autumn here mm -hmm. in Dublin and I started that in 2015 but I think plays take a long time sometimes I, I did dump like three different drafts of it and start again though mm. um, yeah I think like um, you know just dissolving linear time and forgetting what year and month and day and just letting it decide when it needs to be cooked and ready and there's also there's things you can get away now what i've been working a lot for television writing television scripts you hit your deadline on that yeah yeah of course you do not go yeah. oh, actually i need another 15 months it's like I need another 15 years there yeah, I, so I, I, I need a couple of more years with this they literally are it's like a six-week turnaround and or, or you know you've got to you know and when you get notes you get notes on a friday deliver the script yeah you need it on a monday yeah. or a tuesday sometimes yeah. because of shooting schedule so you i understand that you know that's really professional writing and you just get on with that um uh, but sometimes with your own projects, because, you know, your the, the television work that I've done has been adaptations and that's easier in a way, uh, you know, it comes with its own challenges, but it is easier because the material is there basically and the characters are there and you've just got to realize them as fully as possible. <clears throat> with your own work, sometimes you're actually, there's, there's notions of what you want to get at or there are ideas that you want to get at and you want to explore and, and throw things down and see, you know, see where it takes you and sometimes that takes longer you know mm, makes total sense absolutely it's it's ready when it's ready yeah except for when it's not and the deadline is there <laughs> yeah well, there's i used to sweat a lot over that <clears throat> but now i found that if you're just honest with your producers and go look I'm stuck on this and it's going to take a little bit longer. Now, you don't do that with television. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But with other things, just just, just say to them, look, I'm, I'm stuck on this and I, I, I'm I, not sure that I'll hit that deadline. Are we all okay, yeah. cool with that? 
Um, and sometimes just that having that chat will unlock it in you. Yeah, well, it, it releases <laughs> that perhaps as a pent up pressure valve that you've created and, and not in your mind. For sure. For yeah, sure. Um, you wrote a very um, powerful piece uh, recently that I read online and I identified <laughs> with an awful lot of it um, around renting, the housing crisis, the housing emergency, the the idea that, you know, on paper or in, in reality, you're very seen to be very successful, are very successful, have achieved an awful lot. And yes, um, don't have that material um, security in the form of home ownership, nor the ability yeah. to access that. And I suppose I identified with a lot of that in that, you know, I've ticked a lot of the other boxes. The CV looks grand. Mm -hmm. All of that, I've spent 20 odd years renting now. And at some level, it, and I do say it is a choice at one level, but also uh, impulsion and vocation to mm -hmm. be involved in the community and cultural world, which just doesn't bring with it most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time doesn't bring with it 100 grand salary. For sure. And, you know, the breaks have arrived in the Celtic Tiger and then the crash and now all of this. Um, it's, I don't know, look at, what do you want to say about it? I'm going off on my own little rant here, which um, I need. <laughs> this is about you, Mark. Uh, this is about me. <laughs> um, I think I wrote the article because I am now 51. Uh, no, really, I am. I'm 51. No, seriously, I am 51. Um, I believe you, Mark. Um, Your beard is greyer than mine. But just marginal. <laughs> and I realised that I've been renting for a long time. You know, it's been, you know, since the early 1990s, since I accessed welfare payments. I don't get hop or pop during the thing. I stayed working. I pay, a, you know, nearly 2,000 euros rent a month on this place that I'm in, simply because I need my own space to live and also a place to work in. Um, it's the going rate here in Dublin. I need to live in Dublin for my work and et cetera. And I just will never be able to tread water enough to gather myself together to get yeah. a mortgage. You're, you're um, paying two grand a month, 24 grand a year, and you're supposed to save half that again to get to the next also, because i'm 51 i'm going to get a much shorter mortgage yeah. so i would need a much larger uh, deposit um the, the 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 repayments on a house this small that i live in would be less than 2000 a month which is another of those things but i'm going to you know i pretty much i can now never retire i can never plan around the idea that i might become ill uh, if you had a mortgage, you can take out your mortgage insurance. It gives you some breathing space at some point. Renters never get breathing space. They're never allowed to fail. I, I always, I, my definition of poverty sometimes is you can't fail, not even once. Mm. If you're rich, you can fail a couple of times. Mm. And there's always a safety net for you. When you're poor, you cannot ever fail even once. And a renter is in that position. You can't fail, not even once. Uh, because if you do, you're fucked out in your ear. And I find that now what I'm, I can never stop working. I have to keep working. Every year, 4% is added on, regardless of your, of the, of the, um, the, the inflation rate. Oh, 4% rent increase. Okay. It's now it's, it's just added on. And like, it's, it's not even thought about for the last five years, the, the, the inflation rate has been coming in below 1%, sometimes about 0.5%, and it's been 4% every year. So every year it eats into your income further. There's no way of kind of finding, you know, I think for a government to, to allow its people to, of various levels, various incomes, they need to be having all sorts of schemes to allow people, if they wish, to come on board and buy a property there should be a way of converting your rent payments yeah into into a, a thing which gets help now i'm not asking for help i'm not asking for a free house yeah 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 i'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not even yeah. asking for social housing i'm asking for a way into the market but it's not being afforded and actually it's going to cost the government in the long run because the reason I wrote the article actually is because sometimes I blame myself for things. I go, yeah, well, I made all these decisions, so like, fuck it. But I'm not the only one by a long shot. There's a lot of people in my position, people who missed the, the property train because of the crash in, 
eight or eight or nine, uh, 10 and 11, and then who, who started to have to rebuild their career. And then suddenly they find themselves now where they, it's the last chance to land. They, they cannot get on the, um, get on the property ladder. And so there's going to be a lot of homeless old people. Yeah, I think that's already starting to come and, and, and not just homeless, but people living in insecure, precarious situations like constant. Peter, Peter yeah. McFerry talks about uh, housing distress and that there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in distress, meaning like your, your home being your sanctuary that you just don't feel as secure as you should. And I think I said what, in the article that I wrote, I said, uh, I'm one of those people who's doomed to live amongst other people's furniture. The type of person who at the age of 51 has to ask permission to own a cat and that's the truth mm. and i because there is no there are no protections of any sort really for for renters so mark when you say you're doomed like are, are you sort of making peace with your lot here or do you feel like something might swing around are you relying on luck or what you know i am relying on luck uh i have been turned down twice for mortgage approval i doesn't stop me i apply again yeah I've, I have applications in at the moment you know every so often somebody pops up and goes i know a great guy inside apply to them they they you know there's also this thing with some financial institutions don't recognize um what do you call it uh, the artist exemption the artist tax exemption yeah yeah so it makes it look as if your income is actually tiny but because they say non-taxable income is not recognized as income for our purposes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that's the, the 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 central bank's rules. And and they're also not overly keen on self-employed people. Self-employed by definition. people, for sure. Uh, there's all yeah. sorts of, and and it's I mean, it does become an obsession after a while. You go like Jesus. The, this the the market is also being deliberately allowed to overheat at the moment. Um. I also said this thing where I was like, I looked at the last two uh, two housing ministers. They've so they failed so absolutely in their jobs of providing houses for the people, and it doesn't seem to matter. Like if I failed, if I deliver a set of scripts that fail, that fail to get made, that aren't up to quality, I'll be fired immediately. I'm just mm. wondering, like, does nothing have any consequence in? in administrative and political circles in this country. I just, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes I think of, like I mentioned China and Cuba earlier and, you know, obviously we have many more freedoms here, but it, in some effect we have the same regime, but just different colors of it. And, but in other regimes, they get housing and healthcare and I'm not by any means glorifying or suggesting <laughs> we would go that direction, but um, like for me, housing and healthcare are fundamental tenets to well-being. And yeah, well, housing has been has been given over to to the market, uh, um, which is only interested in, in in profit. There's no there's no attempt. There's no. Like attempt I, I, I'm focusing on this market because it, it's a it's a particularly big uh, topic for artists in general. You yeah. know, and 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 we know you probably know lots of people gone off to Berlin and all of that and people say oh sure they'll be back and whatever but it, they shouldn't have to leave their own country you know yeah and, but it has been ever thus I mean the the yeah. arts is a you know they love you when you win a prize abroad they don't love you from day to day yeah they, they pay lip service that's it yeah I mean you know we still are the country that spends the least amount per capita on culture in, in the entire Western Europe. Um, you know, that's that's a fact. Uh, and yet we, we, we're killing ourselves trying to say how, how cultural we are and how important it is. And every time there's a crash, they suddenly go, we love the arts because arts jobs are, are cheap to make in the economy. And mm. they'll, they'll, you know, I remember when the crash happened in 2009 or 2010, there was this big conference and they were all going, the arts, the culture, branding Ireland, brand Ireland. We love the arts. And they just, they slashed the arts funding and they never restored it and were left going, what? Now there has been some support been given to keep things alive during the, during the lockdown. And that has been, has been welcome, I think. 
but uh, but really there is you know I, I worry about younger artists when I you know I wrote Adam and Paul on the corner of my bed in this little bedsit that I lived for 10 years on the North Circular Road that I paid like 40 pounds a week uh, rent on and I was able to survive um, doing odd jobs here and there and uh, bits of acting and all of that. I was able to survive to make that happen. Uh, you know, I, Garage I wrote because my brother allowed me to live for six months or a year in his box room in his flat up on Mountjoy Square. Like without those helps available, you know, I wouldn't have been able to survive, but I did survive. But now for a young act, uh, writer coming on, uh, on stream or a young actor, I don't know how they hang on. Arts, arts careers are built in a, in a stranger way. Some, some arrive really fully formed and they, they go off and they're great. Others are slow trajectory upwards, but there's no room for the slow trajectory upwards now. Mm. Did you ever have moments along the way where you felt like folding or caving or going a different road or was that ever an option? Where would I go? Who would have you? <laughs> Who would have me? Like, I don't have any education. I don't have, this is all I've ever done, you know? Yeah. And also, I love my life that I have. It allows me to, to explore other worlds or, you know, I love the fact that I've made the films that I've made and that they're there in the world and that I've kind of, that I've kind of thought about where I am and these things come mm. out of it. Mm. Um, I just want to go back briefly, Mark, to uh, when you said that, I think you said earlier that it wasn't until your thirties that you really kind of found your voice or came into your own. What, so what was going on in your twenties? Was that just the mashup that goes on often in the twenties? There was all of that. Uh, I was living life uh, I was in love for the first time in my life during my 20s, which was lovely. And I was acting away. I, I got a lot of work in the gate uh, and I did a lot of plays with them from the mid 90s until the year 2000. And then I kind of came to a sort of a one of those natural changes in your in your career as an actor where you're suddenly moving up an age bracket. You're not the young fellow anymore. You're moving into a fellow in your 30s, but the parts weren't there. I hadn't really gotten them yet or and uh, my friend had uh, Michael James Ford had taken over this uh, this theatre space in Bewley's along with Kelly Campbell and they they started programming plays and I had acted in plays with Michael James Ford and he was like you're going to write a play and I'm going to put it on and you've got exactly eight weeks in which to do it and I was like ah and I wrote a play and then I wrote another play and People liked them. They were funny little vignettes. They were only like an hour long each. But uh, but um, Johnny Spears, who produced Adam and Paul, came to see one of them and he really liked it. And he asked me, did I have any ideas for a play for, or a film? Uh, and I said, I did. And when I first moved to Dublin, I had, I had, you know, I'd never seen, or I didn't, don't, didn't think I'd seen any heroin addicts in, in Ennis. And I was, and I was living up, Parnell Square, Mount, uh, Parnell Street, Mountjoy Square area. And there was a lot of uh, homeless heroin addicts around at the time. And I was interested in the way they talked really slowly and they moved really slowly when they were stoned and, you know, falling over in slow motion, you know, they're taking about a minute and a half for them to fall down to the ground. And, and I was amazed that people who had lived in Dublin for any length of time had stopped seeing them. So I'd be like, did you see that guy? He, he just fell over in slow motion, like it took him about three minutes, or two two young women fighting over a chalk ice, or I felt that there was this there was this dance going on in Dublin in slow motion amongst all of us with our busy lives. There was all these boys and girls drifting through life. And so I began taking diaries and writing down things that I had seen these uh these uh the addicted, homeless addicted people had had been doing on the streets and <clears throat> and so I, I pitched this idea of this film set between sunrise and sunrise two boys you never know which one is Adam and which one is Paul and and they meet a baby in the middle that was basically all I knew and I wrote a couple of scenes and Johnny passed them on to Lenny Abrahamson who was making ads for him at the time and we 
we hit it off pretty strongly. He he we, he and I shared a kind of an overlapping taste in things. I really liked Laurel and Hardy and uh he was really into them as well and and he kind of encouraged me to go as far as possible with the script and mm. and uh, and that's kind of where it happened so i was really lucky like it was my first screenplay and it got made and people seemed to like it i think they more than liked it i mean it's it's now part of the canons really like of <laughs> irish culture you know it's funny it's funny mm. i mean it was just a little gang of us making it and and also I made it with Tom and Tom, who subsequently died, Tom and I had been lovers for about eight or nine years. And we had just broken up when I started writing the, the play or writing the, the screenplay. So there's kind of a joke in it, like his character gets hit in the face with a football or gets knocked down by a moped. <laughs> it was me working out my breakup with him. <laughs> we were very we were fine we were we yeah. weren't arguing or anything like that but uh um yeah. i think there's a lovely uh story about how that the conflation of of circumstance people ideas energy mm -hmm. happenings society and it's a perfect kind of case study in where a beautiful idea can be born we just don't know sometimes yeah but like that that makes it sound as if i had choices around that like that pitch that I did to Johnny Spears was the only show I had, you know, okay, that, was the only yeah. thing that was going on in my life at the time. I was going like, I want to go in there. And okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there's like, it wasn't like I could shop this around. Like everybody, anybody I showed the idea to were like, you are absolutely and utterly mad. It's offensive. It's, it's rubbish. Uh, and, uh, and it took somebody like Lenny and Johnny to kind of go, God, that's fun. And it's interesting and it's got depth yeah. to it or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I like at the time when I was growing up and coming of age at that point in my 20s and into my early 30s, Irish films generally were obsessed with nationalism and the national question, which was like the last thing I wanted to write about. Yeah, yeah. It's like, forget about writing about that stuff. Like, forget yeah. it. Nobody I, I would feel that about theatre as well. Like, I, not not so much now, but, you know, like theatre when I was growing up was all set in 100 years ago and whatnot. Sure. And it was also grey and dark. And obviously we're trying to heal and process. and But, like, what's reflecting our realities and contemporary Yeah. Stuff? Well, like, I, I kind of wanted a, to write a play, a write a film that was that looked sort of like looking out my window in Parnell Street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and people want want to see that. Um, do you think it would get made now? Um, and the reason I asked that is because um, I, I think like it's a healthy thing that we're way more socially aware, but I, I also wonder then about the, the so-called PC debate where people say you can't say anything anymore and it's all cultural appropriation which i don't, which I, don't I don't get I believe, too involved I don't in. believe in i don't believe in cancel culture i don't believe it exists i don't believe that there is this pc thing that stops you saying this that and the other <clears throat> you can say whatever you like but yeah. you've got to be aware of what you're saying yeah a lot of time there's there's a rage against things because people are not aware of what they're saying they decide i'm going to write a thing and it's going to be transgender people and you go have you ever met a transgender person? Have you yeah. talked about their existence? Yeah, yeah. Have you listened to them? With us and the, the the people with addiction on the streets, I think every Irish person knows about addiction for sure, but we engaged with a number of groups that that dealt with, uh, that provided services for, for homeless uh, heroin addicts and current users and ex-users. And we talked a lot with people. We showed them the script. We asked them if they have any problems with it, you know. You got to engage with people in that way. And uh, I kind of wanted people who had family members who who had had heroin addiction problems or ex-users or current users to watch it and feel that there was some reality to it. And it it turns out that people who have those experiences do like the film or they do feel it's truthful in some way. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things like in my films, like I use the N word in garage. I use the K word 
um, for you know the for travelers that 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 you know I use that in my work, but I'm aware of what I'm doing within it, and yeah. I feel that I can morally justify it by saying, look, this is you know that word exists in in current parlance and blah blah. blah. Nobody ever mentions the N word from from garage. It's very it's very prominent line. Um, you, you feel like clearly you you feel like it's it's rooted it's so deeply rooted in the reality of how it's presented i think sometimes my belief as a writer is that the writer has got to get out of the way so if it was me saying the n-word through one of my characters mm -hmm. that you can smell that a mile off you got to get out of the way there and if your character uses that word for any number of psychological reasons or and it has an impact on the drama and it has an impact on the other characters in the scene, then you can use it, yeah. If it's truthful for that for, for that character. Um, you've got to understand what you're doing there though. Mm. Um, but this this whole idea of cancel culture, it's invented by the right. Like it's completely and utterly invented mm -hmm. by the right. I just don't believe it exists. Yeah, I, I tend to find that the people who are, are in outrage about it are, uh... Well, yeah. Anyway, it's it's. Uh, I, I think like it's like I can't be raped career anymore. Move. I got to get cancelled now. I got to get cancelled because I'll get a few interviews out of it. And you go, doesn't that actually go against you? What you're saying is cancellation. There are people who are on the very, very top who are claiming to be cancelled. I'm like, are you fucking joking? You me? you have a weekly column in a Sunday newspaper. Exactly. I'm like, yeah. go and screw yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's largely egos. Now, the whole idea of whether you could make Adam and Paul again now, my reaction to that was, does it need to be made now? Yeah, yeah. And apparently it doesn't because it already exists. Um, and also, I think that, that any art or play is of its time. If it's any good, it feeds into the culture that's coming after it. Mm -hmm. If it's not any good, it stops mm -hmm. by itself. Now, I, I saw that... Um, I think uh, Ricky Gervais was saying that he didn't think The Office would be made now because of cancel culture. I just like, that is such bullshit. That is such bullshit. Mm. First of all, does it need to be made now? And second of all, it is one of the most influential series. It has influenced everything that's come after it. Why would he be complaining about that? I don't get it. Well, he, he's probably making a different point there, isn't he? I, I'm not sure what the point is, though. Well, the, the 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 point seems to be grumpy old man point where you you somehow want to uh, make a point that somehow society has become more tolerant or or in, their suggestion is becoming more intolerant, whereas the reality is it's probably becoming more tolerant and more welcoming to diverse. I think so, voices. and it's also like there are things that that we are more aware of now that we can yeah. play differently. It's not yeah, to say yeah. that we're not, I don't see what we're not allowed to say. Yeah. <clears throat> like I, sometimes on Twitter, people say, yeah, but there's, you wouldn't be allowed to say that. And I'm like, who, who says you wouldn't be allowed to say it? Or what is it that we're not allowed to say? And basically it comes down to, I'm not allowed to be angry against something that I know nothing about mm. is, is basic, the basic premise of people getting angry about cancel culture. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But then I think a lot I'm, of it personally... I'm gay and I rule the world, apparently. But anyway. <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of it's imported uh, kind of culture war on the Steve Bannon sure. type sort of... It's a military tool in that information war. Uh, yeah. For sure. Like we had people at the marches that happened, the anti-lockdown marches that happened at the weekend here, giving speeches about about critical race theory and i'm like you just you just read american right talking yeah. points yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah for those listening on the audio version mark just made a, a very mark, appropriate mark. face with a it was kind of a fart face wasn't it mark it was yeah a, a, a classical <laughs> fart face, I would have thought. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with a lot of those, a lot of those talking head people. Do you, I, do I'm you... amazed. One of the things that I have been amazed, just to, to veer off into seriousness again for one second, is how many people lost their minds during 
uh, and lost their moral center during the pandemic, who hitched their ride to the far right lunatics and and claim that they're all about freedom and all that. I'm like, would you ever? And, you know, it, it's been ugly watching that in loads of ways. Mm-hmm. But there have been, you know, I think the great middle ground of uh, Ireland is a fairly unflappable country in, in ways. It still doesn't vote far right. Like it still doesn't do it, despite all the opportunities and the airtime and everything the far right have been given during the, the pandemics and the and the lockdowns, they still don't. And I'm proud of that. Now, some people would say, well, that's because the far right are a of a I don't agree with that, actually. Mm. Um, <clears throat> um, they're very much center right. But but like Ireland is sensible at times. And I, I really appreciate that in them. Yeah, I think we have to give ourselves a break every now and then and, and step back and say, we're, we're not so bad. And, yeah. uh, because you and I are probably not shy about saying where we do fall down yeah. housing and wherever else, but um, on the whole, we're, we're not so bad. <laughs> yeah. I think what we're not very good at is, is proper governance and, uh, and yeah. uh, strategic thinking about how you do things like provide healthcare and provide housing for people. Um, to, to put it mildly, yeah. Yeah, I'm hopeful of a, of a generation change that, you know, that I, I, I think just the writing is so much on the wall right now that we can see yeah. clearly who who's there, what are they doing and not doing and why, and the vested interests involved. And it there may be a vacuum here where a certain demographic just needs to age out or change and that they hopefully I don't know I don't want to pin everything on the young people I hate I hate when that happens that the young people are all going to save us because that almost sort of absolves the rest of us from having to bloody do anything so yes I think we need to get back and uh, get some old classical marches going on and and make the change I think uh, you know we might be on the cusp of having Ireland's first left-wing government which would be interesting if we can get everyone sitting around the same table <laughs> that will be that will be i mean it will be it will be a, 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 a rambunctious government at the very least but yeah so are, are you as this the moment you're kind of you know you've had a run at the presidency mark and i think now might I, be an opportune time the presidency to... i'm i'm doing a slow campaign for 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 the um for the the next presidential campaign well, we'll put that aside for a second. We're, I'm going to I'm going to suggest that maybe, you know, now's a good time to put your hand up for a ministry. <laughs> I'm not sure what ministry I'd like, to be honest. And, you know, I think the presidency would suit me because it just involves waving. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're going to have to earn your stripes. A little <laughs> bit more. I want you in a ministry. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to decide which ministry you want, because we know now you, you need a good deadline. Uh, we'll go arts and culture. So ah, you're so predictable. <laughs> I'm so predictable. I don't want to help. I don't want to, uh, housing. Uh, I just I I end up I I end up being fired within two days. Okay, we'll give you arts and you know you know as minister for arts and culture, you won't be able to have any time to make any art or culture well, directly. You know the the chances of it actually happening are, are pretty slim, but uh, um. That would be okay. That would be. I'm willing to. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. <laughs> You're a noble man. I am. <laughs> Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Mark. And, uh, I wish you well with all the great work and the projects. Thank you, and good good luck, and and uh, have a nice life down the hinge. Thanks, man. Cheers. Cheers. Mm-hmm.